Hello. This lecture discusses how you build your argument. Remember, the argument is the skeleton, the foundational structure of your paper. Your final paper must have sinew, organs, and skin, but without the solid skeleton of an argument, it crumbles to the ground. What follows is advice about formulating an argument, a discussion about the difference between assertions and evidence, both as vital components of the argument, and some tools you can use to lay out or control your argument. These tools work for your paper as well. The first advice I'll give you is this. Put your argument in writing as soon as you can so you can capture its structure. Remember, whatever you do now is tentative, hypothetical, and it is certainly top down. When you work from the research question to the evidence, you're making a research proposal that will guide you as you narrow your work and help you to discriminate between usable evidence and evidence that does not apply. You've done some preliminary research and know the contours of the topic. You've narrowed your topic to its themes, asked questions of those themes, and then chosen one of those questions to answer. Doing that points you in a particular direction, but before your research is complete, you can only speculate about the answer. This is why we call it a tentative claim or hypothesis. What has to be true for the claim to be true? These are your higher order assertions. The craft of research calls them reasons. We'll look at them a bit more closely in a moment. Some of these assertions might require other assertions to support them. They are lower order assertions and must be true for the higher order assertions to be true. But this is carrying the basic form of argument a bit far. Understanding that claims must be backed up by assertions and that sometimes assertions can be subdivided into lower order assertions is what we're trying to say right now. After writing your tentative assertions in support of your tentative claim, write what evidence you have or need to support your assertions. Remember, as you conduct more research, you will rewrite and even rethink your assertions and claim. This refining process is where the real writing and thinking occurs. Finally, jot down a tentative conclusion in which you explain how your assertions support your claim. Yes, this will change too, but you can produce a better structure by articulating the links between assertions and claims. Let's look now at a stripped down version of this argument. This is a simple layout of the argument form. You can use this as a template, including leaving in the labels. Remember, as you plan your argument, you're working top down from what you think will be the answer to your research question to what you think will be those assertions supporting it to what evidence you will need to support those assertions. Everything at this point is tentative. As you conduct more research, you'll stand this process on its head. As you see patterns in the evidence and as you use evidence and contra evidence ethically, you'll see your assertions change from your idealized version to a realistic interpretation of the evidence. It's just as likely that your claim will change as you refine your argument. More advice, stay flexible, keep an open mind, and remember that you're not so much discovering truth revealed in evidence as you are constructing a supportable argument based on evidence. Because the core of your argument consists of assertions and evidence, it's worthwhile to define both so we can tell them apart. Distinguishing between assertion and evidence is a core competency of a researcher. And because your experience and the very nature of qualitative research, this is as difficult a skill to master as it is important. In this section, We'll define and differentiate assertions from evidence, and I hope you'll come away from it with some vocabulary that helps you maintain those distinctions. Your text, The Craft of Research, argues that what it calls reasons 
And what we call assertions are statements that lead readers to accept your claim. Assertions are often feel like subclaims, very narrow claims, or even topics phrased as assertive statements. It's important to distinguish between the two. If the assertion is a subclaim, it links to the claim with the implied word because, and it interprets its supporting evidence within the parameters set by the original claim. When you first conceive of your paper, you begin again work from the top down. You've gathered some information to be able to form a tentative research question properly narrowed down and possibly a tentative answer, a hypothesis. To guide your work, you then make tentative assertions that you believe will support the claim. Such assertions allow you to narrow your research for evidence. Then you flip that and work from the bottom up. When you have gathered evidence as well as contra evidence and have digested it intellectually, you can restate your assertions to interpret that evidence and that contra evidence. As the craft of research makes clear, you base your assertions on your evidence. Your assertions must be true supported by evidence for the claim to be true. Now, let me make an aside here to say that true is an overstatement because of flaws in historical information, sources, and methods. The best we can do is to make an argument that our work supports interpretations that illuminate at least something of the actuality of the past. Be that as it may, let's press on. An assertion might feel also like a topical header. So if it does, be careful. Topical headers are not necessarily assertions. They might denote necessary components of your fuller paper that have little to do with your argument directly. They might let you include context or description or historiography, all of which your paper needs to be complete, but which have little to do with the skeleton of your argument. A rule of thumb is that if a statement feels like you can open it with, now I will discuss, then it's a topical header. If it feels like it opens with, my claim is correct because, then it is a subclaim. Your paper will have all of these, but a problem arises when there are too few subclaim-like assertions and too many topical headers. Without those subclaim assertions, your argument doesn't exist and your paper is a narration or a description. Another distinction that is sometimes difficult to determine is that between assertion and evidence. This difficulty occurs in part because of how you as a researcher mix revealed information with self-discovered information. Both are evidence, but revealed information relies on the authority of the person providing it. Often a researcher takes that source's word for it, but to become evidence, revealed information must pass the tests we'll discuss in a moment. Self-discovered information must pass these same tests, but we are generally more skeptical about its value than we are about revealed information. So what is evidence? Evidence is information that grounds the historian's research in observable phenomena. The observers of phenomena of the past are those who are close enough to record what they experienced in ways that are first accurate, comports with known data points like names and dates, valid, that information and source is internally consistent, reliable, that the information and source is consistent with other information and other sources and authentic, that it is honest representation of the events by a source that was able to observe them. In the Routledge Companion to Historical Studies, British historian Alan Munslow writes that most historians agree that evidence are accounts that demonstrate the closest possible correspondence between events and their description. That is, empirical historians base their work on sources that show a closest possible correspondence. 
our text craft of research defines evidence as a bedrock of established fact that readers agree not to question. In conversation, we often refer to bedrock pieces of evidence as facts, but should we call them facts, implying that they are objectively true and immutable? Without running down an epistemological rabbit hole, let's just say that we can neither be completely objective nor completely certain about a never changing truth but that we can have different levels of confidence in the probability that information accurately reflects the events we seek to know. Thus, the word data better captures the essence of pieces of evidence than does the word fact. The best evidence comes from sources that are composed close to the event in question and do not attempt to mold our understanding of those events. That is, it is not part of an interpretation. Instead, the best evidence allows us to build our own interpretations. Alas, most of the evidence we use will be far from the best. It will come from secondary sources rather than primary sources. We'll be able to gather only bits and pieces, remembering that observers only left traces of events, much of which is gone or inaccessible. And data might be the result of biased or interpreted reporting. This does not make it untrue but it does mean that, that there's rarely a proverbial smoking gun, and we have to test both the evidence and its sources for accuracy, validity, reliability, and authenticity. In the final section of this lecture, I'll cover three practical tools you can use to organize your thoughts, structure your arguments, and even write your papers. If you remember English or writing class, you'll recognize at least two of these as part of what's called pre-writing. The three tools are concept maps, storyboards, and outlines. They accomplish almost exactly the same goal, but they work for different people in different ways. You are not obliged to use any of them, but if any of them work for you, you should employ them fully not just for this class, but for any writing assignment now and in the future. The first tool I'll share with you is the concept map, also called a mind map. This is a screenshot of one of my projects using a software tool called FreeMind, which not only captures your thoughts as your mind freely roams, but is also freeware. Back in the dark ages, when we all had hard copy only, I hated concept maps because they appeared to me to be both silly and inflexible. My thoughts are disorganized and a bit frantic, so I needed a way to capture them that allowed me to arrange them later and let me move things around until I was satisfied. In FreeMind, you begin with a single original circle. I usually enter the working title of my paper to keep me on track. You click the insert key to make a child node, type whatever you think is appropriate, then click enter for a sibling mode or insert again for another child node. FreeMind allows us to edit the node entries so we can thicken them when we see fit. This screenshot doesn't show the extent of my work, so if we expand this node, here we go, we'll see just how much more I've included. Because this was a conference presentation on which I was working quickly, I inserted references for each component directly into the node. But what's happening here? In the gray area, you see two things a topical explanation indicating I offer three case studies and a claim that these studies demonstrate that motorist camps of the 1920s U.S. South differed from the classic description that was based on a huge camp in Denver. I did not directly lay out my assertions that the southern camps differed in the manner of their conception, funding, and lifespan, but I address each of those assertions in each of the case studies. Here you see I've expanded the Decatur, Alabama case study to show evidence in support of my assertions and claim. This was effective for my presentation 
even though it's not a perfect example of an ideal argument structure. I found that concept maps work well for me because I can work on small sections at a time and arrange as I see fit during the pre-writing process, which frankly becomes almost the entire essay if I fill it in enough. I can copy the entire map into a Word document or export it into a LibreOffice document as an outline. Then I can edit it and I have a first essay draft ready to go relatively painlessly. Share with you is a storyboard or wireframe. This is a visual representation of an outline that is substantially more structured than the concept map. Storyboards come to us from the movie and video industry. If you do a Google search on storyboards, all the products you find are for posting a progression of scenes, usually anchored by images and described labels and text. Some of these can get pretty complex. Wireframes come to us from the world of web design and show how the pages of a website link together. Both of these are pretty good analogies for how you work with an argument. You progress from a claim to assertions to evidence, and all of these components are linked to one or more components. You might immediately see yourself using a storyboard or a wireframe but I personally hate them because I can't wrap my head around them. On the other hand, when I showed a storyboard and a concept map to my wife, she immediately dismissed the concept map. It actually kind of freaked her out a bit because she thought it was chaotic, but she latched onto the storyboard. She's a very orderly thinker and you might be as well. This is a model of a storyboard for an essay, but let's look at an example. I downloaded this image from the blog you see cited on the slide. This student used post-it notes on a panel as a storyboard for an art essay. If shapes and colors are meaningful to you like they are to her, this might work well. Much as I did in the concept map, she has blended her argument with parts of her paper. Her blue post-its are her introduction, claim, and conclusion. The green post-its are her assertions, and the pinks are her evidence. Index cards on a tabletop work too, and they're cheap. Also, PowerPoint slides work if you're okay with linear progression. You can use a title slide for a claim, section header slides for assertions, and title and content slides for evidence. Our is the outline. You've seen this argument outline before. You open with a tentative claim. You lay out assertions, higher order and lower order. You lay out your evidence. Then you come to a conclusion that explains how the assertions tie into the claim. Once again, the argument is the skeletal structure of the paper. So its outline looks a little different than that of the paper, which I'm gonna show you here. The structure of the paper is that it opens with an introduction that contains a hook that is a story to catch the reader's attention and the claim, also called the thesis. Next comes the historiography, a discussion of the authors and works that influence your claim and your argument. Next is the body of your paper that includes the assertions and evidence, along with context, transitions, and other writerly components. In fact, you might present your argument in the form of a narrative and or a description, the kinds of essays with which you're already familiar. Then you arrive at a conclusion, which should mirror the argument's conclusion to introduce new evidence in the conclusion is poor form, as is writing an epilogue that tells what happened after the events under consideration occurred. That is, a they lived happily ever after ending. That is not a conclusion. In summary, this lecture provided tools and advice for building your argument. I pointed out that an argument is the skeletal structure of the essay, that it opens with a claim supported by assertions that are themselves supported by evidence. 
you begin the process with an idealized top-down argument that you revise from the bottom up as you do more research so that the assertions interpret the evidence and the claim interprets the assertions. We discuss the differences between assertions and evidence. Assertions are general statements linked to the claim with an implied because. And evidence is accurate, valid, reliable, authentic data. The last section of the lecture considered three practical tools to help you gain control of your ideas and organize them into an argument, then into a fleshed out essay. This then ends the lecture. As always, thank you for your attention.